Thank you very much, and, and good evening, everyone. Technology, technology, technology. We hear a lot about it. And technology is everywhere. It's around our entire lives. We use technology to get to work. We use technology at work. We use technology to come onto campus. We use technology throughout all of our teaching and learning. We do here at the university. We can even nowadays use technology in our home. Not just TVs and computers, but small little boxes which we can talk to. And we can ask this little box to put on our favourite playlist. To organise our weekly food shop so we don't have to. There's a word for this sort of dependence on technology. It's called a prosthetic. Everyone in this room, practically everyone, will have a smartphone. I can see someone using theirs right now. Heavily dependent on using it. Who checked it two minutes before they came in? Who is dying to look at their smartphone right now to see if there's a tweet, an email, a message? And those of you who do give in and actually look at that message, who can then resist the temptation to not reply? Technology is everywhere. Technology surrounds us. And this mixing, this combining of us humans with technology has a word as well. They're called cyborgs. They're mixtures of technology and human. That's a personal interaction. Personal interaction between yourself and your smartphone. You don't have to engage in downloading the apps. You don't have to engage in even having a smartphone at all. But actually, what we do now is we create these robots. And these robots can teach our children. So much so that we can actually design these robots to look like humans. And these human-looking robots teach our children. Puts me out of a job. You look at the research, and the children actually have these emotional attachments to these robot teachers. Do we want this? Do we want our lives to be dictated by technology, to take over what we do, who we are? No, we have a choice. We don't have to engage in this, or we can, and that's fine. We're free citizens in a free society. It's our choice. But technology is everywhere. I got a book for Christmas. To save everything, click here, by Evgeny Morozov. And he develops the idea of solutionism. The idea that for all of our problems, for all of our problems, there is a technological solution. However big those problems, however small those problems, we use technology to solve them. And that's really interesting, because there's a desire for it always to be technology. Do we want it always to be technology? In his book, he uses an example of augmented reality. And we've seen some fantastic uses of augmented reality in the video just gone. And he uses an example of augmented reality in Japan. And in Japan, you can buy this system if you choose to, your choice. If you choose to, you can set up an array of cameras in your kitchen if you want to learn how to fillet a fish, to carve a chicken, and you don't know how to do it. You can mount your headset. You can have this array of cameras in front of you. You can specifically position the chicken, the fish, whatever, on your chopping board. And it will tell you exactly, precisely, in detail, how to fillet that fish. 
how to carve the chicken. But what it will do, it is will tell you one way how to do it. It will give you one example. An example, a method that a group of people or one person thought was the best way to do that task. Do we want that? Do we want to rely on this app, this technological solution to solve this problem? Or do we want to learn and discover ourselves how to do it? This story resonated really strongly with me. As a child, 10, 11, 12 years old, I grew up maybe 100 metres from the beach. My parents' house, it still is, about 100 metres from the beach. And most Saturday afternoons, Sunday afternoons, I'd go fishing with my dad. And on the odd occasion, we'd sit there on the stones, we'd catch something, a sea bass, a cod perhaps. If it was big enough, we'd bring it home, we'd tell mum, and she'd cook it for us. But before that, what would we do? This is a true story. We'd have to fillet the fish. Now, I didn't then have some augmented reality headset I could put on to show me how to do it. I relied on my dad to show me. My dad taught me how to do it. Now, was it the most seamless, frictionless, perfect, streamlined, efficient way to do it? No. But my dad taught me how to do it. He taught me how to remove the dorsal fin, how to remove the head, how to run the knife underneath the fillet against the spine to remove it. And that way, retaining that little bit of grit in the system where you make a slight mistake and you can change, you can adapt, you can learn, you can develop, you can innovate, is having the freedom to be able to do it yourself. But, as I said, it's a free society. Some of you may go, wow, the idea of wearing this headset, I'm never going to be able to do something like this. You can show me how to do it. Fantastic. Others may not. Free society. You can choose. So the Edge of Tomorrow, the title of this event, how technology, technological innovations, are expanding the potential for education and society as a whole. As I was introduced, I teach anatomy. I teach anatomy to medical students at the School of Medicine, down at the bottom of campus. I can see quite a few of you here. I teach anatomy. What's anatomy got to do with technology? Isn't it just dead bodies, cadavers, formalin, scalpels, things you hear of in horror movies? in the dissection lab? Yes, it is that. But if you look at anatomical education as a discipline, how anatomy is actually taught, the education of teaching anatomy, you will see that is inundated with the use of technology. Podcasts, ebooks, audience response systems, YouTube, they're old if you're an anatomist. If you're an anatomist integrating technology, you are using the cutting edge technology. You are using 3D TV, Google Glass, Snapchat. You are using virtual reality. You are using augmented reality. You are using innovative hardware solutions. Anatomy is at the forefront of using technology to support students, to support students in learning, to help them fulfill their potential. But, there's always a but. If you look at the literature, if you actually look at the literature of using technology within education, it is still pretty scarce. Actual literature that shows meaningful learning gains, meaningful enhancement, actual measurable impact that doing this has had real outcomes is still lacking. And I don't believe that's good enough. 
When you talk to educators, some of them, not all of them, as we've seen today, not all of them, but when you talk to some of them, and you say, why on earth, why, why are you using technology for this? And they tend to come back and say something along the lines of, oh, well, you know, it's, it's the solution we thought was best. It's, it's always, you know, it's important that you don't just use technology for technology's sake. It always has to be appropriate. You go, okay. So what's your follow-up evaluation? Yeah, and beyond the happy sheets at the end of the module to say, I enjoyed it, great. I like chocolate cake, it's not good for me. Just because students enjoy something doesn't mean it's good for them. Okay, sorry. So then you say, okay, so what really are you, what's your evaluation strategy? How are you measuring impact of using this technology in your education? And they may come back with things like, well, it's good because we can use technology and technology caters to various students' different learning styles. And I don't know if anyone buys a newspaper anymore, but if you bought The Guardian last week, you'd have seen a letter by leading educators trying to dispel the myth of learning styles. I'm sorry. If you think you're a visual learner, if you think you're an auditory learner, well, good for you. But actually, there is no evidence, a minimal amount of evidence, to suggest that we should use resources designed to match students' learning styles. We know how to design technology. We know how to design technology to support student education. And it's not based on learning styles. The reason I say it, and some of you in the audience will probably go, yes, we know learning styles don't exist. OK, move on. The problem is, only last week, in an educational technology journal, you know, what us academics want to publish in, there are papers that link design of technology to students' learning styles. I'm sorry, it's wrong. Learning styles are not a thing. It's false. Or what's the word we use nowadays? Fake. <laughs> the second thing, instead of using learning styles argument, they'll go, oh, well, we've got all these now millennial students. They're digital natives. <sighs> Again, there is no empirical evidence. Sorry, this is my scientific background in wanting evidence to justify things. Sorry. There is no empirical evidence to support these things called digital natives. Apparently, they're students who, because they were grown up, because they grew up, sorry, surrounded by Facebook and surrounded by YouTube, they inherently need to, know, need to have technology put into their education. Because, well, they're good with that sort of stuff. No, they're not. You'll be surprised in how many emails I get that say, Dear Dr. Pickering, I don't suppose you could tell me how to import a picture into Word, uh, digital native. I'm sorry, it just doesn't exist. There's no evidence to support it. If it did exist, if it was a thing, then 100 odd years ago, we used to send children up chimneys to clean them with brushes. Nowadays, you're surrounded by Facebook and YouTube. They were surrounded by soot and brick. We don't use soot and brick to help teach you. It's ridiculous. So education, it needs to be thought of like you're doing a science experiment, in my opinion. We want to have data. We want to have patterns of research which justifies why we are using this technology. I teach anatomy at the bottom of campus, like I said. And my main primary focus is not to integrate technology into my curriculum. Just because Google or Microsoft or Apple have made a new piece of kit doesn't mean I have to shamelessly just pop it into my curriculum. I'm sorry, no. That's not what I'm here for. Believe it or not, students learnt, teachers taught, before iPads were here. We don't have to just use technology. Now, technology can be incredibly powerful, but it needs to be done for the right 
reasons. And what are those reasons, in my opinion? When I look at my curriculum, when I look at the anatomy rec curriculum I'm responsible for, what am I doing? I'm looking for problems. I'm looking for weaknesses. I'm looking for areas of improvement. And I'm trying to find what is the most appropriate solution for that problem. Not how can I fit technology into my curriculum because it looks good. My interest is supporting students to fulfill their potential. And we need to increase the amount of meaningful research that we do to enable us to make these informed decisions. And I don't think we're doing enough. I think we need to do more and more. And then we need to share it. And then we need to drive out these myths, these ideas, which are still present in the literature today. And why is that? Why is that? Let's go back to the beginning when I spoke about choice. There's lots of technology out there. The public are engaged in all sorts of technology. But they have a choice. With more and more technology coming into our universities, with the transition from traditional to technology occurring as we speak in front of our eyes, actually, the choice that you students have is becoming smaller. So we need to make sure that the technological resources we have are effective, are efficient, and they support genuine impact. They genuinely enhance your learning opportunities. They genuinely enhance and support your ability to go where you want to go. We are here as academics in a university to support your education. And we need to do that with the full amount of information at our hands so we can make these meaningful decisions of how we introduce technology. After all, there was a famous technology historian, Malvin Kranzberg, who said, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Thank you. <laughs>